hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Guys. Welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Storer. I'm Paul Bestel. And this is the show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 131, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about, but can never quite reach. How are you, Paul? I'm very well. We are dried out here, post-floods, so all is good. Yeah, that was a hell of a thing. I I saw that on the news, and I thought, oh shit. Thankfully, you reminded me you live on a hill. Always. It's one of of those Paul Bestel maxims, that, that list of like, Paul's Ten Commandments, always live on hills. Especially in Sheffield, yes. I've survived one great flood in 2007. I feel like there was flooding as well last year or the year before. I feel like there was another time I sent you a message asking if you guys were okay. Mm. And you informed me that, yes, we live on a hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we, if we get water here, it's the end of the world. Right. Simple as that. The ice caps have gone. Mammoths are back. It's over. <laughs> I get, okay, well, at that point, you've got far bigger concerns than uh, the house insurance, so. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the size of the tusks on those things? I just imagine you riding one. I have this sort of... Uh, <laughs> Paul Bestel, would- Lord of the Wasteland. Well, uh, as was the case last week, my mental health is garbage, so we're going to skip right over what I've been doing, and uh, we're going to talk about our first live stream, the Weird Together live stream that happened on Tuesday night. And that was me and Joseph Camo, not Como, as we thought. It's Camo. Had our first live stream talking about the documentary, The House In Between. And uh, it was a great time. We had a few, uh, quite a few listeners turn up. I think we're going to be making that a regular thing. And again, hopefully scheduling some of them during the day on the weekends when you can join as well. And we can talk about slash poke gentle fun at the latest and greatest in paranormal entertainment. <laughs> gentle fun. Is that, is that a warning? Oh, well, no, I'm, I, you're the one who actually, who ends up interviewing these people, not me. No one fucking talks to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. I can say whatever I want. Okay. I'll bear that in mind. You know, the only people I might be worried shit talking is a small town monsters crew because those guys travel. So. <laughs> and well, they're always in Washington state, which isn't that far away, is it? It's only probably a short, what, 11 hour drive or whatever you guys call a short drive. <laughs> uh, Washington state is a 90 minute boat ride. So, yeah, I'm within ass kicking distance. So and those are the only ones we won't gently poke fun at. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> so it was, it was a good time. You can find that on the live stream and patrons get an audio version that they can listen to as and when. So that's, uh, that was a weird together live stream. And I think we're talking about bi-weekly, at least monthly, possibly bi-weekly, sort of depending on, on, uh, really just time constraints and, and things like this. But, uh, yeah, that was, it was very cool. And really, this is all part of a plot to try and monetize our YouTube channel. So if you're not already <laughs> following our YouTube channel, please subscribe. You'll find a link in the show notes. Paul and I were talking about this off air. We want to earn that 16 pounds a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed my life. So on this show, we have an, another set of fantastic listener stories, including a couple occurrences of a black mist, which is something I'm, I'm always interested in because I've had my own experience with black mist, which we'll, we'll talk about but I'm really, really looking forward to it. There is one story which has been shared uh, by another podcast host, and I just, I couldn't help myself because it involves a fridge in an office in Camden. And so I had to name the episode London Fridge is Falling Down. (laughs) And I was up till three in the morning creating the cover art last night. And uh, I don't know, Paul, sometimes I get these obsessive moments where I think, Oh, I got this great idea. Great in quotation marks. And then I just have to pursue it at the cost of sleep and, you know, human relationships until it's, until it's done. Like the last episode, we decided to call it noises in the attic. And Mm. immediately I remembered that old Aerosmith album toys in the attic. And I remember it had this kind of very distinctive illustrated cover. And then I spent the next four and a half hours replicating as best I could that cover and not a single person got the joke, but I was happy because <laughs> I did it. Yes, you've got to be careful with rabbit holes like that, like the one I fell down the other other month when I thought, oh, I wonder what was number one in, in France during the 1980s. And then when I finished that, I thought, oh, I wonder what happened in Germany. 
in the 1980s. And then it was, I wonder what happened in Italy. So I, I eventually checked all the charts in Western Europe throughout the 1980s, looking for weird pop songs that I probably wasn't aware of. And did, you, did you find them? I did. I found the guy from Roxette's first band, which I wasn't aware of. He was in another band before that. All right. <laughs> What's it called? Now I got to know. You can't just leave me hanging. I can't remember what they were called, but they were massive. And then he split, he left them and formed Roxette. Okay. And Roxette's like fading like a flower. Yeah. Listen to your heart. That's it. Joyride. Joyride. Which is the one? Na, 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 na. You've got the look. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I had to sing that in my head. I wasn't performing for the audience. That wouldn't have been fair (laughs) for anybody at all. It's been a long time since I was in the school choir. Yeah. Oh, man. I loved Roxette when I was a kid. Okay. So after I'm done here, I got to go listen to some Roxette. All right. So as I said, we have a great selection of listener stories lined up. But before we get there, of course, we got to thank our patrons. This one's for the patrons. Patrons, you're the shananana to our nananana, which is to say, without you, we would be incomplete. And so, of course, we'd like to thank all our patrons, but this time around, we'd especially like to thank our latest patrons. They are... Molly Stetzer. Susie Q. Jessica Jones, Michael. Imogen Sipthorpe. Naomi Allen. Dana Sandrine. Would we not say Dana? I don't know, would you? I, I would well, say Dana. In, in England, where we speak properly, um, <laughs> Dana Sandrine. He said defiantly, Dana. Dana na na na. Na 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 na. You know who's got the look? Patrice W., our next patron. <laughs> Betsy Sim. <laughs> it's a very Betsy goofy Sim- episode today. Yeah, it is a very goofy one. <laughs> Betsy Simmons. And Merlin Hansen. Folks, thank you so, so, so much uh, for your support. It really does mean the world to us. Making the show is uh, a highlight, uh, highlight of my week. I, I love doing it. Uh, Paul loves doing it. And we love being able to make it for you guys. And your patronage allows that to happen. So thank you from the bottom of our terrible, terrible hearts. And if you stick around to the end of the show, we'll tell you about all the cool stuff you get. But for now, we will say that if you want an ad-free feed, and who doesn't ad suck? then for only a dollar a month, you can get that by signing up over at patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Also, the uh, time codes that I put on the episode will make a lot more fucking sense because I realized I've been putting time codes in the episode notes, but it doesn't account for the ads because I'm a boob. So if you sign up at patreon.com slash ghost story guys, you won't have to worry about any of that shit. Maybe it's a test. I'm sure they found it very testing at times. (laughs) Can you unlock Brennan's code? <laughs> I'm, my, I'm my own Voynich manuscript. Hey, this is me jumping in after the fact with a late edition musical guest. On this episode, we're going to be featuring the track Buzzsaw from The Revenants. Buzzsaw is the first single from their instrumental album Brutalismo, and you can find more from The Revenants at nightharvestrecordings.com. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to a, a very silly ghost story, guys. We we just spent another twenty minutes in the break talking about Monty Python. We're gonna be here all day, <laughs> and there's nowhere I'd rather be. Well, okay, there's one thing, but that's no one wants to hear about that. Turning into a Fleetwood Mac album, this. <laughs> oh man, I watched. This has nothing to do with ghosts, but I watched Casino the other day, mm-hmm. and uh, I hadn't seen it in years. And it, it's, it's a really good movie. I think time has been very kind to it. Cause I, I think at the time it was too close to Goodfellas for people mm. to properly appreciate it. But I will say the needle drops were so on the nose and there's a scene where Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci are sitting in a car in De Niro's garage. They're discussing business plans, but obviously their friendship is fraying. And just in case you hadn't figured that out, Scorsese has Fleetwood Mac's go your own way playing on the fucking car radio. <laughs> Come on, guys. We get it. We, we get it. 
just waiting for Scorsese to come out and spray paint it on the inside of my television. <laughs> not very subtle. But anyways, that, that has nothing to do with ghosts. So before we get to the stories, we wanted to share some mail with you guys because we've got some really, really great mail from uh, a couple different folks over the last little while. And I mean, the, the dream episode, as it always does, dream stuff always brings a lot of feedback. And we are going to be doing a dream episode in the future. So if you've had precognitive dreams or paranormally themed dreams, if you want to send them in, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. We'll try to work them into that show when it finally happens. But for now, we just wanted to share some of the mail that has been coming through. And the first one we're going to talk about is in connection to this, the theme of last show of kids saying insane and terrifying things. (laughs) And this comes from Friday. Friday says, I was listening to the newest episode and the conversation you had about terrifying things kids say knocked loose this gem. We were living in the upstairs apartment of an old duplex, which was actually really creepy now that I think about it. Anyway, I came home from a grueling customer service job at a store where things were generally a dollar, and my then boyfriend, now fiance, let's call him D, says to me he had a strange conversation with our two-year-old. D said he had walked by the door of the kid's bedroom and heard the little one talking, so he opened it to see what was going on. The two-year-old stops talking and looks up at D. D asks him, who are you talking to? The two-year-old says, my friend. D. Oh, what's your friend look like? Two-year-old. Like me, but he doesn't have a face. (laughs) She goes on to say this was also the place where D regularly saw an older man in a bowler hat and tweed jacket and a young woman who would lie next to him in bed. Woof. I love stuff like that. Sometimes I wonder if kids understand how scary they are and just say things to shit us up. No, I think it's because they are conversing and entertaining visitors from other realms. I'm a big believer in that. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's what I actually believe. I, I love the idea also that children are tiny evil geniuses trying to gaslight us into uh, insanity. <laughs> yeah, that's called being a teenager, that part. Ah, right, right, right. I skipped that. I was a very annoyingly well-behaved teenager. Yeah, don't worry, I had your portion. <laughs> this does not surprise me in the slightest. <laughs> Rebel without a clue. Before we get to the next email, there was a fellow I saw on Instagram. He was talking about his son, and apparently his son, when he was born for the first few years, would talk about his previous father, Mr. Kando, <laughs> and would talk about gaslit lamps or oil lamps. Oil, oil, pardon me, I think it was oil lit street lamps was what he said. And this is, this is a kid growing up in Boston in like 2010 or something. <laughs> so he's got no connection to oil lit lamps whatsoever, but for the first few years, pardon me, for the first few years of his life, apparently, uh, this was, this is his thing. So again, he just, it's so hard. It's so hard because I don't, I mean, I'm always open to the possibility of, of past lives, but at the same time, it just, to see it like that, it's so hard to just finally accept it and go, oh, okay. I, I guess that's, that's the thing that's happening. I mean, often as well, these subjects that they bring up, aren't the kind of thing that, because often the people say, oh, well, they've overheard adults talking about things. I don't think I ever in my life have I been in a situation where we've been talking about oil lit street lamps in Japan. No, that's it. And well, apparently I looked it up. Uh, I I don't know this person personally. I just happened to see their post, but I I looked it up. And apparently Kendo is a South American last name. Mm. Um, if I, the site, the first site I, that I looked at, I, I didn't go too deeply into it cause I just saw this before we were going to air, but it's Ecuador mm. was kind of the, the rough, the rough or, origin place that it, it pinned it to. So I, I don't, yeah, I, again, where a child in that time, in that place would hear their parents talk about, yeah, street lit lamps or oil lit lamps in Ecuador. I do not know. <laughs> All right. And so the next email is from. Kerry. Kerry says, I was just listening to the latest episode where you were talking about creepy things that kids say, and I thought I'd add another to the pile. A couple of months ago, my five-year-old daughter asked me if I ever saw peekaboos. Hmm, I said, I don't know. Can you describe what a peekaboo is to me? She's a very matter-of-fact kid, so in a very matter-of-fact way, she told me a peekaboo is when a black hole opens in the wall, but then closes up again real fast, like peekaboo. Do you ever see them on walls, mummy? <laughs> yeah, that's a hard no on that one. 
I told her I don't think I have and asked if she could let me know when she sees the next one. I asked her what she thought about them and if they're fun to see. She just shrugged and turned the conversation discussing her favourite type of unicorn. <laughs> she hasn't mentioned peekaboos again. It's funny because we were just saying that prior to starting the show that, uh, you know, there was a fellow you were listening to who j- just talked about unicorns. <laughs> and, and we do not necessarily consider that person a reliable source, but something about just the guilelessness of a child makes it a little easier to swallow. Yeah. And that story could have been a lot worse, I think. Oh, yeah, because nothing came in or out of said peekaboos. So far. Well, that's what I was just thinking as well. Yeah, that's not to say it won't happen, just that it hasn't yet. Sorry, Kerry. (laughs) Yeah, good luck with that. That reminded me of an email we got a long time ago from Rin. And Rin's uh, Rin's a friend of mine. She's a long-time listener of the show. And she had, as I recall, it was like two hands coming out of her wall towards her when she was a kid. Yeah, I'm just going to see if I can find that email really quick. There we go. So this was actually, this was a, this was a dream. It, pardon me, it started as a dream. This is, this is from Rin. So the, Rin sent this actually to us in 2018. I was having a nightmare where an insane chef was chasing me around a huge industrial type kitchen. I had broken a bowl and the chef had become enraged. It sounds silly hearing it as an adult, but that kitchen was a fucking maze and the chef and I were alone. I was a painfully shy kid and the idea of being alone with a stranger was scary enough without him being crazy and chasing me. I was running and running, looking around stainless steel corners, trying to find a place to hide, all the while hearing the heavy footfalls behind me when someone nudged my shoulder, waking me up. There was a huge pair of flower-covered hands coming out of an opening in the wall. It looked like a dumbwaiter with the doors wide open. They were reaching out for me. I know they were real because they touched me and I could smell the flour and yeast. I started screaming as my mother came into the room and turned on the lights. The hands were even more frightening now that the lights were on. The light shone off the thick red hair on the arms as they stretched and lengthened. It was clear that those hands were going to reach me no matter how far I moved away. I screamed and screamed and wouldn't look away from the hands. My mother shook me and forced me to look at her. Until then, I could only see her out of the corner of my eye. As she came into the room, turned on the light, and demanded to know what was wrong, I tried to tell her by pointing at the wall. But when I looked back, the hands were gone, and there was only the same old wood-paneled wall. Who is to say, right? I mean... It doesn't sound like, like, like a sleep hallucination, you know what I mean? Like you're, you still kind of see part of the dream when you wake up. So I wonder if maybe that was a, a very young Rin's experience with a peekaboo. Hmm. Maybe this is a whole new thing that we've never, because obviously I've mentioned that my incident when I was a child, when I woke up and watched the gnomes on the wall for several hours going about their daily lives. Yeah, yeah. So... Maybe that too was a peekaboo, a peek- peekaboo window. Mm. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I would imagine that one of those things that a lot of people maybe pass off as dreams or, or some kind of sleep paralysis that affects kids in a slightly different way than what we know as adults. But I think there's a lot more to these kind of wall induced incidents than perhaps we're aware of. Yeah, I'm starting to wonder. So if you had an experience with your own peekaboo, do your kids talk about terrifying holes in the walls? <laughs> We're ready to believe you. Ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Finally, we had an email from Ariel, and Ariel wanted to tell us a little bit about the Bridgewater Triangle. She says, in a recent episode, the Bridgewater Triangle was mentioned several times, and I fancy myself somewhat of an expert on the subject. I work as an archivist for the Eastern Massachusetts Historical Society, which is in the Triangle. I've read all kinds of accounts that aren't as well known for whatever reason, like the numerous ghost sightings, cult and non-cult related murders, the devil's footprint, more alien sighting stories, and stories about people getting caught in the quicksand. She says, I've actually been warned by coworkers to avoid Hockamock Swamp for that very reason. Note, Hockamock means the place where spirits dwell, so I would agree that something is up with the land. Oh, and the town of Easton has over 32 cemeteries and burial grounds. That's more than anywhere else in the US, and they're quite old, about early 1700s. I ghost hunt there often, and I have caught some interesting stuff. Anyways, I figured I'd tell a few of those stories and possibly debunk some others that are more popular. A good friend of mine who has lived in Easton his entire life told me this story last year. He was in his backyard with his two brothers in the middle of the day, and out of nowhere, a UFO sat down in the yard. I tried to get him to describe what it looked like, but it was obvious that telling the story made him nervous, so I, I didn't push too hard. In the end, all I got was it had the typical UFO round shape with bright white lights running across it. He and, he and all his brothers have verified that they experienced this phenomenon. And that's where the story stops, because nothing else happened. The UFO landed, stayed in the yard for a few minutes, and then flew off. 
Whatever it came for, I guess they didn't have it. I have no idea. I recently handled a newspaper article from the 1950s. It detailed the sighting of a ghostly woman with long black hair, wearing a white dress and walking along a road near the swamp. Apparently, she was spotted only for a moment by some teenagers, and even the historians I work with aren't sure who she could have been. She also hasn't been seen since. Another ghost story is that late at night, a Civil War soldier can be seen marching along the oldest road in the U.S., Bay Road. It's so old it was a Native American path that was practically a worn-down trench from all the foot traffic. I know for a fact that soldiers used to use that road to get to Boston. In fact, there's one house on that road that has reported hearing an entire company walk by for at least an hour. But that's another story entirely. Anyway, this marching ghost has been seen by dozens of people. It doesn't interact with those who see it and doesn't always appear. The reasons are unknown. I understand the dog sightings have happened in many parts of the Triangle, but I can say for certain that the dogs in Easton were in fact a pack of wolves. According to those I work with, a Pukwudgie has never been seen in Easton, and the concept is laughable to the historians with about 45 years of experience. The possible Thunderbird was actually sighted, but turned out to be a real bird of some type I can't remember. The spook lights are swamp gas, and I think that covers all the popular legends I can explain. And uh, thank you so much for that, Ariel. I, uh, that's, again, always fascinated to speak to archivists because they, they find things that most people just don't. Because a lot of these stories, <laughs> unless you're digging, you're never going to see them. And I, I always wonder how many stories of the strange and weird are buried in historical records that we just haven't gotten to yet. Oh, there's a mountain of them, mountain of them. And, and some of them are obviously, it's quite interesting because I've spoken to Adam Benedict a couple of times on my show and he obviously he does a lot of digging in archives to find old stories and weird things and stories of ghosts and monsters and strange happenings in the past. And it's it's interesting sometimes because you can see trends where newspapers in different parts of the country have just printed the, their version of the same story, just change the names and, and location perhaps, but it's essentially the same thing. But occasionally there will be a really odd story like the one we covered recently about the cucumber man, which is one of the weirdest stories I've ever heard in my entire life. The cucumber man? I must know. <laughs> it's a man who, who, uh, who cut his hand harvesting cucumbers and he got some juice in it. And then he became infected with cucumbers and he turned into a cucumber and it dried him out. And so he turned to a husk and died. And then his family decided to hang his body up in the barn. And then he just collapsed into a pile of seeds and they printed all the seeds and they grew into really massive pickles that the family sold and, and made lots of money from. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Uh, the, the story in the book is, is a lot better than my brief synopsis there, but it's, <laughs> it's full of weird things like, what, who hangs their dead husband up in a barn? Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's one of many questions I have. Dad turned into seeds. I guess we'll just <laughs> plant the seeds and sell whatever grows. Yes, let's eat dad's seeds. Well, never say that again. <laughs> yeah that's when you know it's time to leave that particular party on that note although i don't think we can top that for fear factor it's time for our stories our first story is london fridge from Matt of the Royal Philharmonic Chainsaw Massacre podcast. As a child in the 1980s, I saw a black mist appear and then come towards me, but not like a fog, more like a mass of nothing coming at me. I also had a couple of oddities happen in my student life. A brand new table I had literally just built was smashed to pieces in an empty house. I knew it was empty because I was with everyone in the house, in a local pub but I want to tell you what has been happening at my work over the space of a year. I am a manager of a day service, helping promote independence to people with various degrees of learning and physical disability. Throughout the whole pandemic, we have been open to help the parents and carers with our customers. There have been a couple of corner-of-the-eye moments, such as me being alone in my department, typing away, when suddenly I feel like someone is close by. Now this isn't anything strange, because I have a wonderful security guard who often likes to use me as a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes he'll pop his head round, see I'm working and leave, but then sometimes his burden is too much to bear and he'll talk my ear off. So most of the time, if I feel like I'm being watched, 
I assume it's him. But sometimes, sometimes it's strange. A sound will come from the other side of the room, and when I investigate, I find nothing. This has happened so often that now I often won't bother looking, instead saying to myself, this email can wait until tomorrow, before I can fuck off back home. One particular day, early in the pandemic, I was talking with a staff member about an upcoming Zoom meeting. It was just me and the staff member in the main room. Chairs were scattered around from a floor game session we had just had before the customers went home. I was facing the staff member when I heard a sound behind me. The very definite sound of a chair being put down. Not from a great height, but just as if someone had put a chair down to talk to us. Immediately, I turned around to see nothing, except for one of the chairs wobbling, just slightly, maybe three feet away from either of us. We were both perplexed. On another occasion, I was walking out of the day room, and as I approached the door, someone wearing white walked past it. Because we were in our Covid bubble, and any contractors had to wear white coveralls, I assumed that's who it was, and I asked if they needed help, but there was no one there, and nowhere for them to have hidden. Now at this point I need to stress, I love ghosts and all things paranormal, but also I am a level-headed person, and will only jump on something like this if I can't explain it. This person in white was unmistakable, and close, maybe seven or eight feet in front of me. So either the stress of the pandemic has truly gotten to me, and I'm in desperate need of a holiday, or I've got my own little Waverly Hills in Camden. A few months passed, and nothing really happened, but it became a little joke with us now. The fire alarm isn't working, must be the hazmat ghost, that sort of thing. Months flew by, and then one night I was leaving the building around 8pm. My security guy was urging me to go home so he could do the same. We had done a complete check of everything and everywhere. The coast was clear, so we left. Later that night, I got a call from my trusted protector. The alarm was going off, and he had to go back to the building. And you know what he found? Nothing. Nothing out of place, but an alarm going off on my floor. He FaceTimed me to show me what he had discovered, or hadn't, I suppose. Thrilling story, right? So the next day I came in, had a little mooch around, and couldn't see anything amiss. So I cracked on with my day. About 20 minutes later, a staff member came over to me and said, there's a problem in the staff room. Great, someone has locked up their keys in the locker, I thought to myself. So I grabbed my spare keys and made my way round, as all the while, the staff member was saying that they don't know what happened. We entered the staff room and I saw it, the curtains. The curtains are shredded, but halfway down, like Freddy Krueger obsessed Rottweilers had gone to town on these poor defenceless cheap curtains. I had been there the night before and knew that no one had been there after I left. I locked the door. The window had been securely shut and locked. I calmed the staff by saying it must have been caught by one of the cleaners. There's no reason to worry. Then I called my security guy. We stood there, gobsmacked. Neither of us could explain it. He even checked the CCTV, but we only have three on that floor. Front door, back door, and side entrance. Nothing out of the ordinary, and no one but the security guy came in between 8pm and 7.30am. And finally, more recently, the security guard messaged me on a Saturday morning to say that the fridge in the learning disability section had been pushed over. That's my section. Now it's a big fridge, six foot tall and screwed into the wall. Health and safety and all that. This poses some questions. Who was in the building at the time? No one. What do you mean by pushed? Could it have not fallen? Nope. Health and safety and all that. What's the damage? The door is broken and there's a dent in the floor. And finally, where does one find an old priest and a young priest? So uh, thanks, Matt, for sharing that. And I, because I'm shit with email, I only sent him a message last night asking about follow-ups. And he did have some information. I didn't have time to get it into the script. So I will share that with you guys on the next episode. Um, but it did remind me, we had a, a message, or pardon me, I had a message on Instagram from a listener named Takana. And uh, I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. But uh, they said, I live in New York State and work in a small town called Munsey. I work at a firm there. And back in 2019 to 2020, until we started working from home, 
I used to notice shadow people running around my office, but thanks to you guys, I tried not to be freaked out. And they followed up with a couple pictures from the office generally, and I, I'll send them over to you, Paul. They, I can't, unfortunately can't share them publicly, but they do have a bit of, they do have a vibe to them. They do mm-hmm. have a, a, an, an unpleasantness to them. And, and I just think, what a horrible thing. It's, it's not bad enough you have to be in the office, you know, <laughs> but now the office is haunted too. You get used to it. Ours is quite pleasant. Oh, you have, you have an office haunting? Oh, yeah. Yeah. R- really? What's it like? Normal, really, as, as, as having a haunted floor. Because it's only a, well, it's supposed to be a floor, but there's been a couple of incidents that have happened on another floor. So it's clearly not tied <laughs> to one particular area. Um, it's one of those places, I've worked in a couple of places where people will always say that you can smell pipe tobacco, which is quite a distinct smell in this True. day and age. Because not many people smoke pipes in the UK anymore. Certainly not tobacco ones anyway. And um, <laughs> uh, so obviously it's a non-smoking building. It's the fourth floor, so it's nowhere near the smoking area. You know, yes, there's a, there's a restaurant on that floor, but you know, there's nothing that they cook that smells like pipe tobacco. And if they were, I think they'd have been shut down. So it, it occasionally just feels this drift and there's the occasional cold spot and papers will get knocked off things and flutter about, that kind of thing. Chairs will get moved into different positions, but you never know because, you know, usually over the weekend, there's only the cleaners in. Right. Um, but one of the cleaners came up to me a couple of years ago now because somebody said, oh, you should talk, tell Paul what happened to you. And she was cleaning on the third floor in the toilet. She cleaned it, went out, and then she came back. It's basically this floor quite small. It's basically meeting rooms, toilets, stairs. That's it. And lifts. Right. There's nothing else on it. And as she came back round, she heard the door slam. So basically, she'd gone out, gone right, followed it round, come back. So basically, to get to where she was, she was back near the toilet because she'd gone in a loop. Okay. Um, and as she got to the top of the stairs, she heard the toilet door shut. And she thought, hmm, well, that's a bit weird. It's like seven o'clock. There shouldn't be anybody on here. And also in our office, we've got those lights that come on when you move. Right. So obviously, by the time she'd been round, the lights had gone off and they were still off. So the door can't shut without the light coming on because obviously somebody would have had to have walked under it. Right. So she, so she walked round to the toilet, opened the toilet door and the cubicle was shut. So she pushed the door and it was locked. So she went, hello? No answer. Hello? No answer again. So she looked under the door. There's nobody there. So she's like, oh, this is, this is really odd. So she thought, book of this. <laughs> <laughs> so as she turned around, she just heard the, and the door unlocked and just Holy swung open. shit. And she apparently bolted, like, literally like Usain Bolt, out of there, <laughs> up the stairs, and she will not clean the third floor on her own. That happened about four years ago. And she won't clean on that floor Jesus on her own anymore. Jesus Christ. I can't say I blame her. Just like with Matt's story, if I came in to the office and I was there alone and the goddamn toilet stall unlocked itself, I would be finding a new place of employment. And Matt, if, if I walked into the office and something had in the night shredded the curtains like a wild animal, but nothing turned up on camera, I would similarly not be going back to work anymore. I go out of my way now to use those toilets. Of course you do. <laughs> I mean, never know what you might find. True. There's some poor gin in there. It's just like nothing we do scares this guy. <laughs> We've tried everything. We just want one room to ourselves. but there's this one bald guy. He just doesn't <laughs> care. It's like he can see us. He just, just mad dogs us while he's peeing. It's really uncomfortable. <laughs> Rosenberg from Jacob. On the outskirts of Rosenberg, Texas, my very large family lived in a five bedroom house on a seven acre plot of land. In the early 2000s, my grandparents purchased the land and had the house built. In total, seven of my family members lived in the house. My grandparents, my mom, my brother, my sister, my brother-in-law, and myself. Though the house was big enough to accommodate everyone comfortably, my younger brother and I always shared a room. During the day, the house was warm and inviting. There was always something cooking in the kitchen, and the aroma of coffee lingered throughout. At night, that warm atmosphere went away and was replaced by a heavy feeling of being watched. I hated being alone in the house, and I especially disliked being alone in any given room. 
Weirdly enough, only certain members of my family shared these feelings. My grandpa, mom, and sister never sensed anything off in the house, but my grandma, brother, and I, we were very affected by these weird feelings of being watched. My grandma was especially affected. My grandparents' bedroom was right next to the kitchen. My grandma had gotten so afraid that she left the kitchen light on every night. My grandma has diabetes, so she wakes up a few times during the night to use the bathroom. Every now and again, she'd see a shadow figure with a distinct hat walk around her bathroom or stand in the doorway. On one occasion, she woke up and thought my grandpa was walking around the bedroom. She asked him why he was up and got no response. After turning on the light, she discovered he was sleeping on his recliner. For years, the random sightings continued, and the activity seemed to be isolated to that specific part of the house. On another occasion, some family members came to visit us from out of state. They slept in our living room, which was also next to the kitchen. My grandpa had turned off the kitchen light so they could sleep. At some point during the night, my cousin woke up and thought she saw my grandpa walking around in the kitchen, and he paused to look directly at her. She asked if he was okay, and when she got no response, she turned on a lamp in the living room and found the kitchen empty. Needless to say, they slept with the lights on that night and told my grandma about the experience the next morning. My grandma didn't want to frighten them, as they were staying with us a few more days, and so she decided not to tell them about her shared experience with the Shadow Man. I only ever saw the shadow man once. I think I was maybe around 10. Some days my brother and I would come home and no one would be around for a couple hours. Since I was old enough, I would usually be the default babysitter. As I said before, I hated being alone in the house. Usually we'd come home and throw our backpacks in our bedroom and run out to play outside. We'd stay out there until one of the adults came home. On this particular day, we were playing catch and I was facing the house. The sun was setting and the kitchen light was on. With no warning, through the windows, I could see a black silhouette of a man almost gliding across the kitchen. It looked like my grandpa, but moved too fast to be him. I froze and began crying. Even now, almost 16 years later as I'm writing this, I feel anxious. I'd seen the shadow for less than a few seconds total, but I was sure of what I'd seen. It took me a few nights to get over that sighting. My family believed I'd seen something, but they were quick to reassure me that it couldn't hurt me. A few years ago, Hurricane Harvey ripped through the gulf and flooded our house. We rebuilt it and lifted the house on stilts to prevent any flooding in the future. Since then, the uneasiness and feeling of being watched are still there, but my grandma hasn't seen the shadow again. Since we built this house, I'm sure the entity came with the land. Unfortunately, we've never gotten around to researching the land, so I'm not sure if something actually happened there. And thank you for sharing that, Jacob. Texas is somewhere that's definitely on my, my bucket list. San Antonio, especially, is an extremely haunted city. I did not know that. For the longest time, the only thing I knew about San Antonio was that there is a place there that sells a hamburger, which is like a food challenge. Mm. It's one of those things that's supposed to be so spicy. If you can finish it and not die, you know, you get it for free or you get a plaque or something. But it's, it's a, well, I saw it on one of those food shows. The guy had to eat it with rubber gloves mm. so he didn't get any of the crap on his hands. And I thought, that's going inside you, man. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps he should be wearing the glove in his stomach. Yeah. Or finding a new line of work. I think it was the man versus food guy. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Adam Rich, Adam Richman. Something like that. I both admired and, and felt for that guy because I thought, this is taking years off his life. Yeah, he looks completely different now. Oh, did he drop the weight? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like, it looks like a completely different chap. C good for him. Maybe he is a completely different person. It's mm. entirely possible he just died and it's a walk-in scenario. <laughs> I, I didn't know San Antonio was haunted, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Russell Rush haunted tour. So that's based in San Antonio. Um, oh, so okay. They've been out and invested a lot of locations around there, and they're all on YouTube, the Russell Rush show. Right, um, right, right. So I recommend if anybody's never seen them. I, I, I discovered it at the beginning of the pandemic, which seems like a million years ago now. Russell Rush and, and, and his team investigate a lot of locations around there, like haunted jailhouses and old farms and spooky things like that. And I think they do one episode in San Antonio Zoo. And Ken okay. Gerhardt turns up on it quite oh, randomly. No way. 
Yeah, hunting chupacabras. Ah, in the zoo. <laughs> yeah, well, Ken works there, doesn't he? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's fascinating. And Ken, Ken's been on your show a couple times? Uh, three, I think, for definite. We've done, hang on, we've done Nessie, Bigfoot, Thunderbirds. Definitely been on at least three times. Might have been four. But yeah, Ken's, and he was on the 100th episode as well. It was a fascinating story about a chupacabra that wasn't, which, was meant, which made it more interesting, actually. Now for bonus points, can Paul remember the episode numbers that Ken was on? <laughs> um, right. Um, he's definitely on episode 120, which is a lot less, I think. Well, um, clock's running down. Will you win the case of Turtle Wax? 46. And I want to say 16. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking it up. We we're playing this game live on air, folks. <laughs> well, an episode 100. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So your answers. Your time is up. Your answers are episode 100, episode 120. Yeah. 46 and 16. All right. So he is on episode 45. Ah. So they were, you were close there. That's big for that. That, that was Bigfoot. I like this game. <laughs> so 120, 45, and 22. Ah! So, as always, check the links to the show notes if you want to hear those episodes of, uh, of Mysteries and Monsters. And I, you were saying that uh, whenever we mention an episode on a show, you tend to see uh, a corresponding jump in uh, downloads for that episode. So Yes, so thank you, whoever's finding those out. And apologies for some of the early episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find myself saying that a lot. I apologize for the early episodes. Not of your show of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's third birthday this month. Oh, shit, it is too. Do you have anything planned? Uh, I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. I've got Fair. A, a, a very popular returning guest for episode 175. Ooh, exciting. You didn't tell me I was going to be on. Yeah, I should. I, I, haven't had time, I haven't had time to prepare. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know me. Now I've got my next 12 episodes planned. Um. <laughs> I love this about you, folks. I, I literally pick a guest for largely the truth. I don't know, three or four days before the episode has to air and try and book an interview with the person. And Paul's got his next 12 episodes planned. He's probably, you got what, the next three recorded? <laughs> uh, I've got two episodes out of those 12 to do so the other 10 are done and I've interviewed the other 10 yeah ladies and gentlemen Paul Bestel <laughs> <laughs> three stories from Tommy for about a year now I've been experiencing really intense night terrors about once a month they tend to loop for a chunk of the night with a, wa with a waking pause in between that allows me to breathe for a moment before falling back into the loop again. Most of them have a similar pattern as of late content wise. Most of them have a similar pattern as of late content wise. I feel like I'm being tossed around or being dragged off my bed and I hear myself screaming and struggling against non-existent forces until I somehow break free. Though I never actually leave my bed, I guess I dream myself getting up and fumbling my bedroom door, open to go find Merlin's room. He's my safety person and I recently moved in with him. But by the time I get to his door, I'm weak from the constant fight and my knocks are just quiet taps. In some versions I don't leave my room at all, but I sense his energy is in my room like a protective force. Normally I don't really see things out of the ordinary in this state, but during the one I had about a week or so ago, I saw a black humanoid with two sets of arms crawling on the ceiling above my bed. Freaky. When I was about 15, I saw a fully-fledged shadow person. I was waking up for school one morning, and my bedroom door was open, which was totally normal. What was not normal was the about six foot or so figure standing in the doorway and holding on to the wall. I stared at him for a few seconds before blinking, and of course, he was gone. When my dad emerged from his room, I told him what I saw, 
His face paled for a moment and he stuttered, That, that was me? But he seemed spooked by what I had said, and I think we both knew what I had seen. Over the next few years, I would see shadows in the hall that weren't supposed to be there, and orbs of black mist would float into my room on occasion, which I would then tell to shove off, because I was trying to sleep. The barn-turned-house, which Merlin and I live in, has its own cast of spectres we live alongside. There's a cat that Merlin once saw as a very real, full apparition, and a creature we can't tell if it's a dog or maybe a small horse but it once booped him with its nose as he was working in the downstairs jeep shop. And then there's Mr Dixon, one of the barn's previous owners, who is still very attached to the building. When I was about to move in, Merlin and I had agreed that my room just had some really weird bad energy, like something had happened in the room. So one of the nights before I moved in, he saged it. It seemed to help a little, but something still seemed off. So I ended up one night having a talk with whatever was in there and telling it that it was in my space now and whatever was in there needed to leave. After that talk, I fell asleep and when I woke up the next morning, a very bright white light apparition of Mr Dixon was standing protectively at the foot of my bed. We haven't seen Mr Dixon since, but there's been a complete energy shift in the room and besides the night terrors, I haven't had any problems. First off, thank you, Tommy. Thank you for sharing those stories. And we have some, uh, the next, next up, we're going to have stories from uh, Tommy's roommate, Merlin. And they've got some really, really cool stuff. And I, Paul and I were just joking uh, off air that um, we're both stumbling over the readings today quite a bit. And I try to leave some of the mistakes in because they can be fun, but they've just been, they haven't been the fun mistakes today. They've just been kind of like <laughs> the annoying God damn it, why is my mouth not working kind of mistakes? I've forgotten how to read. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, me too, man, me too. I, <laughs> I was just saying to Paul, there's, remind me of that scene in The Devil's Advocate, that magnificent Al Pacino vehicle from 1997, where, you know, they cast a voodoo curse on the opposing prosecutor. And I, I just assume somewhere out there, there's a cow tongue with our names on it. <laughs> I don't know who we've pissed off, but we did a good job of it. Yes, yes. Also, one of Charlize Theron's first roles in Hollywood. That is an underappreciated film, I got to say. And I, I was, and this has nothing to do with your story, Tommy, I'm sorry. Um, but I was lucky enough to see, see it in the cinemas before they edited the shit out of it. Because they, I don't know if, if you know the story, but they didn't have the rights. I think that's Rodin's Gates of Hell mm. in uh, Milton's office. If they didn't secure the rights to use it. So once it hit home video, they had to chop the shit out of that final scene and re-CG a bunch of the uh, statues, the moving statue stuff, because they had not secured the rights. So, mm. so back to Tommy's story. And thank you for your patience. The thing that really jumped out at me there. So the thing that jumped out at me there, there were two of them really that jumped out. I mean, Tiny Horse, being booped by Tiny Horse sounds yes. fantastic. I mean, I have seen shadow people. I have never had Ghost Horse boop me on the face. And I got to tell you, I would like that because my cats were assholes. Yeah. So if Ghost Horse wanted to come around and just say hi, I would be totally fine with that. And it's unusual for a spectral horse to appear in such a situation. Usually they're often seen trotting down lanes or through fields. And again, too, we see the appearance of the Black Mist, mm. which came up in Matt's story and will make one more appearance. And, and when it finally makes its third appearance, that's when I'll, I'll tell my, uh, my brief interaction, tell, pardon me, tell of my brief interaction with it. But we had that really interesting story from Oliver. A few episodes ago. And if you remember the similarity here, he also saw a shadow person crawling on the roof of his room, mm. on the ceiling of his room. And in that case, when he turned on the light, if I remember correctly, it disappeared, but a single flake of skin yeah. floated down from the ceiling. Mm. And I couldn't help but think about that when reading Tommy's story. I was thinking that, you know, this, it's the same thing, basically. It, the only difference is it's like Goro for Mortal Kombat. It's got a couple sets of arms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking of Carly. <laughs> I think that nicely shows our educational background. <laughs> Paul went to school. I played plenty of Mortal Kombat myself. Okay, fair. But yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's interesting. And I, and I got to say, if shadow people are going to start climbing on our goddamn ceilings, Paul, I'm out of here. Yeah. I like these more unusual encounters like this. Um, I've done a recent episode where I've touched on a, a, a very 
disturbing shadow man case that's currently occurring in Ireland at the moment. Really? And it was quite interesting that we were talking about how the shadow man, the hat man, isn't really being reported a lot in the UK prior to sort of the last 10, 15 years. And we were kind of saying, is it because people are hearing stories from North America and utilizing them or have they always been going on? And it's because it's now become more wide known and people are quite comfortable talking about these entities that they feel comfortable enough to actually bring them out these days over here. Maybe. I wonder sometimes too, if these things, maybe they travel, Hmm? you know, maybe that, uh, they're in, you know, maybe they're kind of nomadic. I mean, the, the idea of the hat man moving around kind of reminds me of that Stephen King book, Dr. Sleep, or I should mm-hmm. say, I watched the movie. I didn't read the book, but <laughs> yeah, but there's those people just like moving around from place to place feeding. Mm-hmm. And it makes you wonder if such a thing happens with the paranormal, maybe hat man or hat men or the hat many, there we go. The hat many are nomadic and yeah, that maybe they, they've kind of put as many franchises over here as they can possibly, uh, possibly sustain. And so now just like KFC, they're seeking out, uh, they're seeking out fresh markets for people who don't know any better. (laughs) Yeah. Well, plus there's also the concept of haunted people rather than haunted properties, which is not overly common, but I think often some people doesn't matter where they go, things follow. There's that too. Yep. Absolutely. And I do tend to think in cases of stuff like the hat man, I think that can I mean, obviously, Tommy, you know, in your story was not the hat man, but I think, I think that does seem to follow people. There does, that does seem to be a little more attached. Although it was something we didn't talk about in Jacob's case is the fact that after they raised up the house, it stopped. Mm. And part of me wonders if that thing is still moving back and forth through the space that used to be the kitchen, but has now been raised up. Mm. You know, if it's one of those repeating things that, and so that's why they still feel kind of hooky. But the actual thing causing it is passing unnoticed beneath them now. Mm. I'd be curious to know, Jacob, how high up the house was raised. If it would be, if it would account for, for that, you know, if it was high enough that it would be the, the height of a person. And if so, if that could account for why you're not seeing it, say, I mean, it's still happening. It's just happening beneath. So thank you very much, Tommy. Mr. Dixon for Merlin. I live in a massive labyrinth of a historic stable, a little over 100 years old. It was where livestock sales were held in my town from the early 1900s until around 1962. Back then, it was a lively little town not far from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, with a railroad station, trolleys, hotels, factories, and many stores. Nowadays, it is a sleepy bedroom town, but some of it is coming back to life as people discover it. Mr. Dixon owned my stable and advertised sales from the early 1930s until at least 1960. I live in part of the hayloft, and the bottom level, the actual stable slash tack rooms, is my vintage Jeep restoration shop. The building has multiple stairwells, cubby holes, multitudes of doors. People literally get lost inside and text me. When I first moved in, I met twin brothers who grew up playing and helping with the stable. They are the ones I first heard the owner's name from, Mr. Dixon. One brother told me that around 1960, Mr. Dixon was in a bad car accident near Gettysburg. I did some research and then found that he died in 1962. And shortly after his death, a lawsuit was settled awarding a large amount of money to individuals suing Mr. Dixon for the car accident. I'm curious if something related to that is what led to us seeing him regularly. Moving in was hectic. I had to move my restoration shops with projects in progress, my own home, and renovate what was basically an abandoned building, all at the same time. Needless to say, we disrupted a lot of the building, threw out dumpsters of garbage we found, and more. As things settled, my friends and I started to notice a couple things. One was a not-quite-there cat. Now, there is an outdoor cat that hangs around the barn, and I have four indoor cats that stay in the house section. But there was another cat. My friends and I would catch it out of the corners of our eyes. Sometimes he would trot across a repair bay or the unfinished section of the hayloft. A year or two ago, I was giving a friend a tour of the barn. We walked through a door and I saw movement on top of the bar. There is a bar and vintage movie theater seats in the unfinished hayloft. Merlin, this place sounds awesome. I turned, thinking one of the four cats had escaped and nearly jumped out of my skin. There was a new cat, fully in view, walking towards me happily. Great friendly energy, but totally unexpected. I let out a shout of surprise, and my friend asked if I was okay. 
I turned to him, then looked back, and the cat was gone. My friend didn't see it. Then I explained Ghost Cat to him. That was the clearest a cat ever was, and I haven't seen him since. Either my shout scared him off, or he put one last bunch of energy into being as visible as possible just to say goodbye. He is missed. Our other regular is reminiscent of the shadow men people see, but he isn't one. Early on, I would catch a figure walking across the hayloft sometimes. Others would see him downstairs. Sometimes he is a lighter or darker shadow, always wearing a hat. As I normally wear a Stetson, this causes some confusion. He also likes a stairwell area. More than once, someone has seen him in the hat and thought they were seeing me, then followed him to find he had disappeared. That would fuck me up. When I hired an assistant, Jeff, he immediately saw Mr. Dixon. Jeff thought, as usual, that he saw me, went to follow me, and then he walked around a corner and there was nobody. Standard fare for Mr. Dixon. We only figured out who our regular was when I was doing research on a local forum and a former neighbor began chatting with me. I was just out looking for historic information and she was chatting about living next door in the 1960s. Out of the blue, she says, I wanted to go back and explore the building after Mr. Dixon died, but people kept seeing him in there. I wrote back and said, well, that explains who we're seeing, which of course led to a longer conversation. One friend, John, swears Mr. Dixon was holding onto his elbow in the loft one day. John often enters the building shouting, hello, Mr. Dixon, which he quickly follows up with, and no touching. <laughs> that's, that's smart. I like that. A few other friends usually shout out a hello to Mr. Dixon when they come over as well. Recently, we tore out and rebuilt the stairwell that Mr. Dixon would linger in. That seems to have unsettled him as he appeared in a couple new locations in the building. He even appeared in my roommate Tommy's bedroom one night and seems to have helped them with their night terrors. Obviously, we like him and are hoping that we did not disrupt him too much. I recently found out that he's buried in town. I intend to find his grave and leave something on his birthday every year from that point on. Hopefully, that will help him a bit. I often wonder if his car accident, the lawsuit, and his death left him troubled. Or if there's even more of a story that we will never know. And maybe that is why he is wandering his old stable. So, thank you so much, Merlin. And, I mean, the unfinished business thing, you know, sometimes I, I poo-poo that. But I know when my stepfather passed, and I don't think I've talked about this on the show. I might have. I part, I've talked about part of it. but. When my stepfather passed, he was, um, he was you know, fair, a fair bit older than my mother, uh, but they'd been very much in love for a very long time. They dated in the nineties and then got back together. And when he passed, his grown children were absolute fucking garbage people. Took my mother to court and, uh, it, it was just a mess, just a mess. And he often would appear to my mother in sort of in dreams or sometimes in like that sleeping, waking state. Hmm. And as I recall, you know, he would say things like, I'm really mad. I'm really mad about what's happening because before he had died, he had explained to her what he was going to be doing with his stuff. And he was not a wealthy man, but his kids thought he was. Mm. And I think at one point he had been, but you know, time and bad investments, these things happen, right? Uh, so yeah, he told, but he told my mother, he said, my kids are going to be fine. You don't have to worry about it. This is all going to work out. And she told him, no, there it's, it's not. And sure enough, she was right. And, uh, yeah, he would, he would appear in her dreams and tell her, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm really upset about this. And sometimes too, she would feel him waking as well. One time my sister actually saw him sitting in his truck parked outside the house and then he was gone. So he was definitely, it felt like he was around. And I kind of wonder if that's what's happening with this Mr. Dixon. Mm. Uh, there's something old fashioned about experiences like this. As you say, the old unfinished business or messages from beyond seem to be something that we've lost, I think, in the modern paranormal era, because a lot of classic ghost stories tend to be somebody with unfinished business or famous stories. The Fred Fisher one from Australia is a prime example of unfinished business. <laughs> so I, I like them, but also the fact that it, he seems to have brought a cat with him as well. So yeah. even on the other side, we gravitate towards animals. I... I'm still in that place where I'm wondering if cats aren't just cats in this context. You know, I wonder if there's sort of a representation thing there. Mm, well, true. As we are both cat owners, there are occasions where one of my cats will just appear and I'll be like, where, where have you, what, have you come through the floor? Where, where have you been? <laughs> yep. You just like sat there and they're like, hello. And then you do something and they vanish. 
but the last time we were recording, your cat just bashed its way in <laughs> so it could like look around and leave again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What are you doing, you wanker? Oh, this is boring. Bye. <laughs> There's an episode of this. This is a deep poll. There's an episode of the sitcom Full House. Do you remember that show? I am aware of it. Okay, so when I was a kid, it was on the television. My grandma would leave it on, and there was one episode where the the youngest daughter didn't want to go to bed because she was convinced that something awesome was happening after she went to bed. <laughs> and so she had a dream where she went to bed and then she snuck back downstairs, and her her parents, like her dad and her uncles. They were all down there playing dolls and doing each other's hair. And this was what she thought was happening when she went to bed. This is what she thought she was missing out on. Yeah. And I just sort of figured that's what cats are doing. They're like, well, if he's got that door closed, something awesome is happening in there. And instead, you're just trying to record a podcast or jerk off or whatever it is you're trying to do. (laughs) Cats like disgusting. (laughs) Podcasting? Give me a break. Get a life. (laughs) Go make some friends, you fucking nerd. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah i mean that's a fair point cats are cats aren't they they can just as if by magic appear from nowhere but i think usually you kind of get used to a cat being around because they do tend to sort of once they feel comfortable they keep returning don't they so the fact that they mention it makes me think that it's unusual yeah oh absolutely i, I was thinking more in terms of like sometimes I'm, i wonder if the cats like if we're what we're seeing as a cat isn't necessarily that you know if, if there's if if the, the cat is how we see it, like in terms mm. of what it's spectral if we're seeing we think we're seeing a cat but again we're just kind of seeing the closest representation to that thing or if cats you know have a different kind of um if they move through that part of that world in a different way mm. i mean i guess they move through our world in a different way so why not the next one yeah true true and often cats are linked with their abilities to sense the paranormal more than any other animal species though i don't know if we've ever really done any tests to see if bears are good at spotting ghosts um (laughs) which would be interesting i'd like to do that in a secure environment though Um, i just had this image of a bear smashing down a door while some poor guy's got his dick in his hand (laughs) (laughs) what is happening in here (laughs) Well, there are, you know, there are strange people out there that keep bears as pets and good luck to them. You know, I remember seeing that interview with a guy that had a pet alligator and he used to have a bath with him. And I thought this is only going to go on for so long, isn't it really? (laughs) The alligator's just having fun with it. Biden this time. (laughs) Just tenderizing him in the salt water. Yeah. Put on the moisturizer. That's good. That's good. (laughs) Yeah. A bit of barbecue sauce there between your toes. (laughs) People keep all kinds of weird pets. So it would be interesting because cats are intrinsically linked with all aspects of the paranormal regardless. And that is something that crosses cultures and histories and civilizations throughout the modern era, doesn't it? Going all, you know, you look at the reverence the Egyptians had towards cats. So who yeah. knows? Yeah, fair enough. And before we go out, I just wanted to say that um, in Tommy's initial email, uh, they said that they and Merlin will drive to work together. And just about, uh, I've got it here. We listen to the show just about every morning that we go into work together. It's a very pleasant start to the day. And I just think that's very cool. So I replied and I said, you know, I, I, I've been doing this for five years now, as I was saying to you, it's been five years as of February 2nd. And I still kind of forget that people actually listen to it. <laughs> you know, I, I know that doesn't make sense because this is how I make my living now, but I just don't, it it just doesn't, the two things don't connect in my head, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Imposter syndrome. <laughs> yes. Yes. As I was, I was saying, uh, I, I just interviewed uh, Glenn Warren from the Seasons Eatings podcast, uh, which you'll be hearing a promo for that actually in the show. Well, if, 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 you're, if you're not a patron, you'll be hearing a promo for that in the show. But, uh, and Glenn, Glenn's Canadian. He's from Newfoundland. And we were joking that uh, Canada is the ancestral home of imposter syndrome. <laughs> so I don't know if we, if maybe we, you, you got it from us somehow, or if it is in fact imported from the English. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I think we, we suffer from the exact opposite, unfortunately, in this country. That's a great point. Okay. Yeah. So that's all right. We can lay, lay claim to one thing. <laughs> oh, Canada. The black mist from Sam. This happened to both me and my dad around a year ago, 
and since have agreed not to tell my younger brother, as we both equally know it would scare him senseless. Although we do speak about it on a regular basis, we are always cautious as to who may be listening. It was a weekday evening, a normal day like any other. It was late autumn, so it was already growing dark outside. Myself, my dad and mother were all sitting downstairs watching the television. My mum and dad both sat on the sofa, whilst I was sat on the floor, laid down next to the dog. As we were both watching the television, something caught my eye at the far end of the living room. It was a large black circular mist like an anima... <laughs> it was a large black circular mist like anomaly that I would roughly estimate to be about 50 to centimetre centimetre... <laughs> 50 to centimetre cent cent centimetres. <laughs> this is the remix. <laughs> whoop, whoop. That I would roughly estimate to be about 50 to 60 centimetres wide and about 30 to 40 centimetres in length. It essentially appeared and manifested from complete thin air. This thing then proceeded to slowly move down our living room, past my head, and into the darkened dining room, where it seemingly vanished. For context, we have an open plan dining living area, and the living room lights were switched on, but the dining area was more or less pitch black. This whole process lasted roughly 10 seconds for it was long enough for both me and my dad to notice it. Roughly five seconds after the anomaly vanished, my dad started to laugh and then proceeded to say, Did you just see that? I replied yes, but I wasn't laughing as the whole situation genuinely creeped me out. My dad then just simply laughed and said, That was really, really weird? My mum then overheard my dad over the volume of the television and asked what he found so weird. We then both told her exactly what we had both just witnessed. Needless to say, she definitely did not believe us, and just presumed that we were winding her up. I have still not forgotten about this incident, despite it happening nearly almost a year ago, and I know that it also creeps my dad out whenever it comes up in conversation. I think it's also really important to mention that both my mum and dad do not believe in the supernatural, and it would be hard for you to find a bigger sceptic than my dad. And despite both me and my dad trying to identify a reasonable or scientific explanation behind what we saw, we still have no idea or who, we still have no idea what or who we saw that evening. The phone call that never was from Sam. As mentioned within the previous story, both of my parents are massive sceptics of the paranormal and will always dismiss any conversation in reference to it. I personally find this really strange, as my mom has told me several stories in the past for which she has no logical explanation, but yet she still refuses to acknowledge any theory that could include anything even remotely supernatural. This is one of her stories. Around three to four years before I was born, my mom and dad both bought their first house together. It was a small semi-detached house in an area not far from my hometown of Bristol. They lived in the house for roughly four years before moving to the house we now live in, as they didn't want to raise a child in the area where they were previously living. The house they lived in, from what I've heard, was extremely creepy, and a fair amount of unexplained things occurred throughout the, throughout the time they lived there. One really creepy aspect of their old house was that towards the end of the garden was the old structure of an archway entrance to the field behind. Now what makes this eerie is that this field behind was and still is a graveyard and an old church. Before the house they lived in was constructed, this archway acted as an entrance to the graveyard, and many caskets passed through on their route to burial. One night, however, whilst living in this house, the bedside phone started to ring in my parents' bedroom. Bear in mind, this is around 2 to 3 in the morning, and they were surprised that the phone was ringing. I believe that my mum decided to ignore the call and proceeded to go back to sleep. That is, until 20 minutes later, when the phone started to ring again. At this point, my mum started to worry as she knew that her grandmother lived alone and would frequently call the house if she needed anything. As a result of this, my mom decided to answer the call this time around. She recalls there was no noise for around four to five seconds, and then someone started to heavily breathe down the phone. Despite my mom asking her grandmother's name down the phone several times, no one replied. After the call, my mom was understandably distressed by the manner of the conversation, or the lack of it, I suppose. However, despite her telling my dad that she felt she needed to visit her grandmother's house to see if she was okay, 
My dad eventually calmed her down and persuaded her to go back to sleep and wait until the morning, as he expected that my mother's grandmother had accidentally dialed their house number. Eventually, the morning came, and as soon as my mom felt it was appropriate, she called her mother and explained how her grandmother had called their phone in the middle of the night, but there was no one on the other end. My mom's mother then calmly replied by saying, Your grandmother's not at home this weekend. She's away in Devon visiting her cousin. Despite my mom claiming that she wasn't scared, I know for a fact that this really bothered her and she was genuinely creeped out by the whole ordeal. Fast forward around two to three weeks later, my mom and dad had seemingly forgotten about the event. However, then the phone bill came in the post that month. And sure enough, there it was. The phone call from my grandmother's house was recorded on the phone bill and the details of the call were clearly listed. Incoming call, 2.10 a.m., duration, 5 minutes, 11 seconds. For what it's worth, I, I don't actually know the specific duration of the phone call or the time, so I'm, I'm guessing for dramatic effect. I also cannot stress enough how important it is to remember that both my mom and dad are massive skeptics, and both still claim to this day that the phone call definitely did happen, and that they have absolutely no explanation for it. So first off, thank you, Sam, for both stories. And there's, there's a lot to talk about there. I mean, I love spooky phone stories. And <laughs> this is either a burglar who got real lonely or something much stranger. Yeah. I always like those phone calls, stories where you have people who work in hotels or, or hospitals where they'll get a call from a room that's empty. Yeah, Sam, that is, again, it, it's, it's fascinating too that, the, that Sam's parents are just, no. And especially because Sam's father saw the black mist. Mm. So imagine you see this, this odd black mist, you know, it's practically a peekaboo in midair. Yeah. I mean, where do you go when, with things like that? Like, like Sam says, they're both deeply skeptical. So I often wonder how you explain something like that when it's just occurred and it's so weird and it defies logic and reasonable explanation. As with anything, if you see something odd, you should always try and look for the reasonable explanation. Strange sure. things can happen through normal reasons. But, you know, as Sherlock Holmes said, once you remove all the explanations, whatever's left has to be the explanation, regardless of how peculiar that may be. And I've paraphrased that terribly. But <laughs> that's essentially what Holmes's edict was, that even if it seems outlandish, often it can be the only explanation. I mentioned that I, was, I had a black mist story. And so it's not a very long story, but before we go, I thought I'd, I'd bring it up. And uh, no doubt I've said this on the show before. I think I've told every one of my stories multiple times now, you know, doing this for five years. I'm only, I've only done so much shit. But uh, one night I was out for a drive with my friend, Joey. We were out for a drive and it was, it was late. I want to say it was about 1130, quarter to 12, maybe. And it had been a quiet night. It was, uh, not very busy out. It wasn't overly dark, but it also wasn't a very welcoming night. But as we were driving through town, not, not a, a particularly wooded or secluded part of town, we were driving towards Royal Jubilee Hospital. There was a section of the road up ahead where it looked darker than it should be. And it was almost like the road and the trees were covered in a kind of black mist. You could see through it but there was definitely this, this mist there. And I'll never forget, we drove through it because, you know, there's nothing else you can do. And it was, we both got these intense chills as we drove through this, this, this cloud. And as we were out of it, we both kind of looked at each other and said, did you, and both of us had, we both had felt this odd sensation. And, and again, when I was touched by the shadow person, it was similar. It was kind of like a tingling, chilly, electrical feeling. But it was just this big black mist kind of covering the mm. road and, and up and it extended up into the trees. I remember that much. And it, the, everything around it was that much darker. And then once we passed through it, it was gone. I don't think I ever saw it again, but it definitely that one night you, you could not miss it. Mm. If you have a story of the black mist or, or anything else you'd like to share with yeah. us for a future show, send it to ghoststorygues at gmail.com. You can also leave it as a voice message on the ghost line as Lindsay did and as you will hear about in the next segment. But we love hearing your stories. We love hearing from you guys. Uh, again, we will always try and get as many of your stories as possible, either into the main show or our Book of the Dead mini shows, which come out every week opposite the Ghost Story Guys main show. So obviously this is coming out Tuesday. Next Tuesday, you will get episode four of Book of the Dead. So 
We will always try and get your stories into one of those two things. And again, we just love reading them. So make sure to keep sending them in. And with that, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Have you ever wondered why we sing and eat figgy pudding during the holidays? How does the butter letter from 11th century Rome create the perfect holiday dessert? Join me, Glenn Warren, on Seasons Eatings as we explore the history and origins of your favorite Christmas foods. So head on over to SeasonsEatingsPodcast.com to subscribe on your podcast app of choice. Hey there, listeners. Before you reach for that skip 15 seconds ahead button, I promise you this isn't an ad. We wanted to take a minute to talk to you about mental health. On this show, I've always tried to be as honest and open as possible about my struggles with depression and anxiety, because even though we've come a long way towards acknowledging the very real damage these things can do, there is still way too much lingering stigma about reaching out for help. And when you start to feel like there's no help, it's easy to start feeling like there's no hope. But Paul has joined me today to remind you there is always hope and there's always help. We're not going to try and talk you out of self-harming right now because we know that's not how it works. Instead, what we wanted to do was tell you something now and hope that should things get bad, you'll remember it and make a phone call or send a text message before you make any permanent decisions. As someone who knows all too well just how important mental health can be. It's never too late to reach out. In Canada, the number to call is 133-456-4566. In the USA, the number to call is 1-800-273-8255. In the UK, the number to call is 116-123 or text SHOUT, that's S-H-O-U-T, to 85258. In Australia, the number to call is 131114. However bad shit seems, it will pass. And no matter what your brain might be telling you at any given moment, and believe me when I say I know this intimately, there are people who love you and people who care deeply about how you treat yourself. Should a time come when you find yourself despairing, Please know that we've both been where you are, and there is a way back to the world. Take care. Welcome back. As always, thanks to Luke Greensmith, Anthony Germain, Sarah Kent, and Joseph Camo, and everyone else who's part of the Ghost Story Guys family. Don't forget to check out Luke's podcast, Luke Lore, available on podcast platforms everywhere. And the first episode of Joseph's show, In Search of Ghosts, is on YouTube, and you'll find a link to that in our show notes. Thanks also, of course. To my friend and co-host, the paranormal Johnny Carson, host of Mysteries and Monsters, Paul Bestel. What's coming up on Eminem, Paul? Um, well, we're about to dive into some more UFOs. I've got the marvellous Kevin Randall, who I've wanted on since I started the show, on this week discussing Leverland. Um, I've got a special episode diving into a bit of zombie in popular culture and history. And then as Weirdly, as these things work out, I've then got two episodes focusing on Wales because it, I was being considering doing a bit more about Welsh paranormal history and cases and locations. And then, you know, like buses, two episodes come along at once. So I've got an episode about the ghosts <laughs> and hauntings of Wales. And then the following week, we've got probably the most remarkable alleged UFO encounter in Britain in the last 20 years. Oh, fabulous. Keep an eye out for that, and uh, where can everyone find you online? You can search by looking for Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms, YouTube, and all good podcast handlers. As for me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as Largely the Truth. You can find my other podcast, Largely the Truth with Brennan Store, on podcast platforms everywhere. That is a non-paranormal chat show. My most recent guest was Glenn Warren, as I mentioned earlier. He's a host of the Seasons Eatings podcast. That episode just came out last week, and Glenn came on to talk about the history of holiday foods. I learned a lot about 
the folks who are involved in the Christmas 365 community, folks who, who do the Christmas vibe all year round, which I, I really respect, and so much more about the history of food. It's a really interesting show. Again, you can find that everywhere fine podcasts live. That's Largely the Truth with Brennan Store, And you can find me at largelythetruth.com. If you want to get in touch with the show, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com is the primary way to do that. We're also on Facebook and Twitter as Ghost Story Guys. We're on Instagram as The Ghost Story Guys. And we're on Reddit as r slash Ghost Story Guys podcast. If possible, it's best to send stories in through the email. That's ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Although if you don't feel like typing, you can always call the ghost line. There's something strange in your neighborhood. We're gonna call Ghost Line. Call one triple eight five eight eight six nine two oh. Thanks to Amber Pease for her ghost line jingle. Again, that number is one triple eight. 588-6920. You can leave your comment or story as one or a series of voicemails, which as you heard on the previous episode, we may play on the show. So again, that's one 588 6920 Of course, if you want to become a patron, head on over to patreon.com slash ghost story guys. That's patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Dollar a month gets you an ad free feed. And up from there, you have access to our weekly shows. We have uh, book of the dead and host adventures, which come out weekly. There's also me and Paul, which can be anywhere from 20 minutes to our last Q&A was two hours and five minutes long. <laughs> There's the sunken library. As I said in the A segment, you get audio versions of Weird Together, the YouTube show that I've been, started hosting with Joseph Camo, and so much more. There's a great community over at Patreon, and we would love for you to be part of it. Come join the conversation. Come hang out with us and our, our, uh, our other folks, and you can do all that at patreon.com slash ghost story guys. If you want to pick up any Ghost Story Guys gear, head on over to our Tee Public store at ghoststoryguys.com. Follow the links. And if you do buy something, let us know. Send us a picture. We'd love to post it up on our socials. And again, that's ghoststoryguys.com. You'll find a link to our Tee Public store where you can get shirts, mugs, all kinds of good stuff. And if you want signed copies of my book, A Strange Little Place, you can get that through our website as well. Finally, this year we're really looking to grow the show, so if you enjoy what we're doing, make sure to tell folks about it. There's nothing better than a personal recommendation to get someone interested in a podcast, and uh, we would very, very much appreciate it. We'd also, of course, appreciate a five-star rating and review wherever you can, but the personal touch is what really sells it, so we, we would, again, we would appreciate that. Our theme song, Radio, Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter of Pizzanta Music. Find more from him at nightharvestrecordings.com or by searching for Pizzanta Music wherever you get your tunes. Our stories theme is The Future Belongs to Them Now by Hexagram. Hear more from them by searching for Hexagram wherever you get your music. Again, that's Hexagram with two X's, not three. And I guess that's going to do it. So, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, into the darkness we go. Very tiny loan sharks are now happy. Baby loan sharks. No, no, I was going to do the doo doo thing and no. <laughs> yeah, quit while you're behind. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> the last time I was in France was in uh, Strasbourg <laughs> mm. and I was there with my, my buddy and we got into a, we went to a, this little cafe up on the river and I realized I couldn't remember the French for two coffees, please. <laughs> and I was just staring at the waiter. Fuck, fuck. Oh. Dose? De- nope. Mm, zwei? Nope. They don't want to hear that. Especially in Strasbourg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> De café, s'il vous plaît. 69. Nice. <laughs> Anyways, if I'm going to be living over there, I'm going to have to work on this. <laughs>